I'm Sanjay Prattasarathy, Chief Marketing Officer for 26. We're excited to be here at the first virtual ECOC and the first virtual market focus event and share our perspective on how engineered materials and compound semiconductor technologies are enabling biomedical optics in this day and age of COVID. We will first start with a quick introduction to 26. How are engineered materials and compound semiconductor platforms enable biomedical optics? And then get into a market discussion, present the macro drivers, the trends, and then drill down into segmentation and sizing, and then discuss how the different materials platforms and technologies that were originally developed for optical communications applications are now front and center of biomedical optics, including the fight against COVID. And I'll do that by elaborating on a few examples. 2.6, 2.6 as the name implies, comes from the periodic table and indicates that engineered materials are the foundation of everything we do. We provide solutions at all levels of the value chain in various market verticals. We are the market and technology leader in optical communications with one of the broadest and most vertically integrated portfolios in the industry. Here we show some examples of engineered materials and compound semiconductor platforms that enable various end markets. We see platforms like Indium Phosphide, Gallium Arsenide, Garnet, which we as an optical communications community are quite familiar with. However, what's interesting and exciting is how many of these platforms serve as enablers in multiple market verticals, including life sciences. Two six products and solutions play a key role in various life sciences applications including PCR testing for COVID-19. I'd like to play a short clip about PCR-based diagnostics and the importance of some of our engineered materials platforms and, and optics. The high demand for innovation in biotechnology creates new opportunities for advanced products in the life sciences market. At 2.6 Incorporated, our focus in the life sciences is on manufacturing components and sub-assemblies for analytical tools that interact with light, such as those used to amplify and analyze genetic material in a process called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. PCR was invented in 1983 and won a Nobel Prize for American biochemist Carrie Mullis. Today, it is a widely used technique in molecular biology for quickly replicating small fragments of DNA or other genetic material into large enough samples for detection, diagnosis, or further analysis, such as genome sequencing. The PCR process is also used in fields as diverse as forensics to solve crimes using DNA evidence and public health to test people for COVID-19 and other diseases. PCR often involves a precision instrument called a thermocycler, Test tubes containing a mixture of genetic material and specific reagents are loaded into the PCR machine, and the machine cycles the temperature of the samples very precisely and very quickly, over and over. The thermocycling serves to separate or denature double-stranded molecules into single strands, and then rebuild or anneal them into exact copies of the original template using complex enzymatic reactions. The denaturing, annealing, and extension processes caused by the rapid heating and cooling cycles work exponentially such that millions of copies of the original molecule can potentially be created. Thermal engines from 2.6 that drive this rapid cycling are the state-of-the-art in chiller technology and thermal control, achieving precise and very uniform temperature shifts as demanded by this technique. Along the way, light-sensitive molecules can attach to the replicated DNA and will fluoresce when excited by a light source such as a laser or LED. The illumination light passes through an optical illumination assembly, often consisting of an array of specialty filters, lenses, mirrors, and beam combiners and splitters that propagate and process the fluorescent signals. Multiple signals at different wavelengths can be combined to illuminate the DNA sample. The wavelengths are then separated and detected by a special imaging device that will transfer the fluorescent signals into a computer for analysis and readout. 2.6 manufactures the light sources, such as lasers and LED modules, as well as the advanced filters, lenses, mirrors, and other components that make up the signal detection pathway used in PCR. 
Now let's move on to the market. The worldwide healthcare market is projected to reach 10 trillion by 2022. There are huge differences in per capita spending depending on where you live. We see a big trend of the shift in focus from sick care to healthcare. Unfortunately, COVID has pretty much taken over front and center as far as global healthcare is concerned. Now, if we look at some of the other market drivers and trends, the world is aging and this will drive certain treatment areas. Technology advances is one of the largest growth areas with examples being in point of care diagnostics, virtual health, at home monitoring, and all of these areas have received a big boost due to COVID. We believe personalized care throughout all courses of disease progression will continue to be a central theme. Examples here include ter targeted therapeutics based on personal genetics, 3D printing of implants, artificial organs, and personalized wearables. Lastly, environmental concerns continue to increase largely in the areas of air and water monitoring, food and beverage testing, and pharmaceutical quality assurance. Now let's drill down into the life sciences market. So from a $10 trillion market, we get into life sciences, which is a $800 billion market, which spans applications from molecular to cellular, from the organ to the patient. Drilling down further, we get into instrumentation. Any analytical device used for the measurement or treatment purposes, and we believe this market is about a $350 billion market. And then when you drill down further into applications that involve heat or light management, that is a two to $3 billion market. Now let's move on to see how we can segment this market. The way 26 likes to segment the life sciences instrumentation market is in, in three areas, biotechnology, medical, and scientific. Each of these areas require optical components and modules and tailored engineered material solutions. Biotechnology examples include microbiology and thus uh, cellular biology, whole animal studies and sequencing for drug discovery. Medical examples uh, include endoscopy, medical lasers, ophthalmic treatments and fluorescent imaging. And scientific examples uh, are in air, water, food and beverage monitoring and, and scientific imaging. So let's focus on the biomedical optics market and look at two of these segments, biotechnology and, and medical, and drill down further. Biotechnology has diverse instrumentation, but we have this very simple cartoon that shows the similarities of, between most of this instrumentation. There is usually a light source, a LED or a laser or white light, which illuminates a sample, and the sample is undergoing some chemistry. And then there are signals that are generated, which then propagate to a detector to optically measure either fluorescence or color or luminescence. On the medical side, we have more diverse applications, again, with similar optical designs in a given area. For example, high power lasers for treatment, imaging for endoscopy, and finally, point of care diagnostics. Now let's move on and see how engineered materials and compound semiconductor platforms enable subcomponents, which in turn enable devices and modules, which in turn enables the end, end solution. I also thought it would be interesting to show some examples how the same material system, the same engineered material system, enables two different markets, and in this case, biomedical optics, which is the focus of the presentation, and our favorite optical communication applications. So let's take business telluride, which is a key thermoelectric material, which we use to make thermoelectric coolers, uh, which are key for high power pumps and, and tocerosa applications and optical communications. And, and the same material is critical in the thermal subassemblies that are used in PCR and sequencing, uh, including COVID-19 diagnostics, which we spoke about earlier. Let's move on to gallium arsenide, a laser platform, a compound semiconductor laser platform, that is used to make vessels, which are then used in short reach transceivers and optical communications applications. And then the same platform now in the form of bars and stacks and um, chips, et cetera, used to make medical laser modules for a variety of applications. Moving on to micro optics, we, we see lots of applications in biomedical optics, 
and lenses, et cetera. And we've, we've seen these uh, earlier in the video and, and some of the other applications. And we are very familiar with micro optics and its use in wavelength selective switching, diffractive optics, et cetera. Thin films, again, filters from thin film materials are, are very commonly used in optical communications, WDM, PON, and other applications. And, and thin films, again, thin film filters for fluorescence are used in PCR equipment and in, in color wheels and other life science applications. Finally, zinc selenide and zinc sulfide, the material that started it all for 2.6, uh, finds itself formed into lenses and mirrors for spectroscopy and infrared imaging applications, which again are, are vogue right now with COVID uh, for thermal scanning purposes. And then uh, yttrium aluminum garnet and yttrium lithium fluoride materials for, for medical laser modules. And finally, I want to show CVD diamond. Uh, diamond's a unique material. We're seeing a lot of new applications emerge for biomedical optics and spectroscopy in other areas. On this slide, we can see two examples from a system perspective. They both integrate engineered materials and optics, but with very different purposes. On the left is a flow cytometry platform. Flow cytometry is a versatile technique for various purposes, including diagnostics, R&D, and drug discovery. You can see the laser, the flow cell, how the sample is illuminated with multiple lasers in some cases, multiple optical filters, signal detection, and processing. And on the right side, you can see a medical laser system that's delivering a laser treatment to a patient, in this case, for an aesthetic application. Um, here we are showing a more detailed list of components and modules that are used specifically for biotechnology applications. Again, a, a large gamut of components and modules from multiple engineered materials platforms, um, the, and from laser sources to optics to sub-assemblies, to thermal solutions. And on this slide, we're, we're, we're doing the same thing now for the medical segment. Again, I'm sure you can appreciate the overlap with optical communications, whether you're looking at wave plates or gratings that are used for wavelength switching or crystals for isolators or vexels for transceivers or DCs. It's the same underlying engineered materials platforms, the compound semiconductor laser and detector platforms, which are used in, in these applications. Earlier, we talked about PCR and I, and I showed you a video on PCR. PCR is the gold standard for COVID-19 diagnostics. It was the very first test that was approved by the FDA and still continues to be the workhorse for COVID testing. So once a person is swabbed and the samples are collected, it's sent to the lab and in the lab, it's put in a microwell plate with other reagents and thermally cycled for over 24 hours. And if the virus is present, it would be replicated many times over the viral DNA, RNA and then it attached to a fluorophore, which then under the presence of the laser will fluoresce and that fluorescence is detected after going through some very carefully tuned thin film fil filters that are looking for that tiny window uh, of, of wavelength. And I, I wanna conclude with showing you some more examples of engineered materials in the fight against COVID. Diagnostics and point of care, we discussed that at length. But here on the right side, you can see applications in UV sterilization. Uh, there are activities that are looking at gallium nitride based UV LEDs for sterilization applications, infrared thermal monitoring for temperature detection using zinc selenide optics, coolers for transport, laser therapy, and variables. Thank you for attending this session, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you for your pre-recorded. I see you're now live, so to take questions. Uh, it's an exciting talk. Um, I think it was the only talk in this session that mentioned COVID, and I think today's an important day with the first recipient in uh, the UK getting the, the vaccine. So all very exciting. I do have um, a couple of questions here. Let me have a look at the, uh, the chart here. What, uh, what material platforms will 2.6 be looking to expand into? You gave a really nice cross-section of materials that you're working on today, quite quite uh, broad, actually. Can you give us any ideas of what really excite you? Yeah, um, they're, they're, um, we are always looking for materials platforms that have 
applications in multiple segments. Uh, and that's how kind of we de-risk some of our investments. Diamond is an exciting one for us. It's, uh, you know, if I were a design engineer, I would make everything out of diamond. It's the best, you know, whatever property you take, whether it's electronics or thermal properties or conductivity, um, strength, hardness, et cetera. We've seen a lot of um, applications that are emerging for diamond in, in various, uh, from simple electronic schooling to uh, it's bioenerg, so in certain life sciences applications for cell growth, um, uh, it's it's also used in prosthetics. We're being explored for, um, so there there are quite a few. If you're asking me which one material that I, I'm excited about, uh, it's certainly diamond. No, no, I uh, I certainly agree with you. It's been used successfully in power electronics for years. Um, let's see. Um, one of the things that, uh, and the question comes up, a similar sort of question from uh, Sudip, is that when I was looking at your biomedical direction, and I, I certainly see the, um, the similarity with the work that's done in the communications field um, and applying some of that work. But the thing that was going through my mind was integration and miniaturization. And so the question from Sandip was on silicon photonics, but I'd like to ask the question in terms of, you know, where do you see integration playing a role in biomedical, handheld diagnostics, those sort of things? Yeah, I, I think if you, uh, in one of my uh, cartoons, I, I had uh, a cartoon of, uh, of the similarities between, let's say an optical transceiver or an amplifier and, and some of these biomedical optics. It's ultimately about miniaturization. Right, what used to be a transponder card uh, is now a, a is a is a pluggable optic, a 400G coherent um, you know um, transceiver. Uh, and one of the previous speakers showed one of our IC Trosa as an example. I mean, the amount of miniaturization and integration in this particular case using an phosphide uh, is is remarkable. And and what we're doing is we're saying we're seeing the same miniaturization, the same underlying technology essentially being ported to some of these biomedical applications, whether it is a, a, a variable that is, uh, that, that is measuring, uh, you know, a variable glucometer, uh, for example, or, or it, is, um, it, it is a compact uh, diagnostic system. Um, it, it's, it's, it's the same platforms and the same miniaturization and, and a, a great example of how one industry leverages the capabilities or the progress that another industry has made. Oh, great, great. No, that's a great answer. I have uh, another question here. A couple of, just have a couple of um, questions with some short answers and then we'll sure. we'll go to the a panel. Um, from a 2.6 perspective, what is becoming of the indium phosphide market compared to silicon photonics? So if any, any light you can share on that quickly would be sure. appreciated. Sure, so, so 2.6, uh, we are a technology agnostic company. Uh, indium phosphide is a great platform. We've, uh, we, we've got a lot of activity going on in indium phosphide, and we've been very successful in, uh, in a lot of these next-gen applications, including uh, the IC Trosa that I mentioned before, and some other speaker mentioned before. So it's, it's one, of our, one of our many technology platforms that we have in the company. Um, silicon Photonics is another technology platform, but I don't think the market is a one-size-fits-all. We do have silicon photonics activities within the company as well, and um, uh, and and we believe that for certain applications, um, you know, silicon photonics um, um, will definitely play a role. So, I, I I don't think there is a it's not one versus the other. It's it's both, and in certain care cases, well, you know, one technology will will do a lot better than than the other, and we never try to force fit a technology platform into an application. It needs to be the best technology platform for that particular application. And that's what we're gonna take into the market. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with you. Um, whether it's gonna be a pure play or not is an interesting question. I'm certainly using the word hybrid when I talk about these platforms a lot more this year than I have before. Um, one really quick question uh, for a quick answer. There was a, any thoughts on gallium oxide as a potential new material came from somebody? Just a quick answer on that one. Um, gallium nitride is something that we we look at. Gallium oxide. I'm I'm not uh, too familiar with that uh, with that with that platform uh, specifically. Um, so I I don't something I have to I have to look into. 
All right. No, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you for your talk.